Welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Buzz Podcast. We're so happy that you're joining us as we talk about different topics uh, in the Catholic world and having to do with our Catholic faith. My name is Father Daniele, and I'm always joined by people who are uh, better experts on these topics than I am. This is uh, Josh Sullivan over here. Josh, how are you doing today? Good. Good. And uh, the man who's afraid of needles, Matt (laughs) Van Milligan. Matt, welcome to you. Welcome. We are in the middle of a a stay-at-home order, and yet here we are. Yeah, okay. keeping the longer distance. If you notice, we had to get a couple extra tables under here. That's right. So we have uh, the appropriate distance between us, and we uh, obviously have uh, the correct permissions to do this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because we are uh, filming a production. A production. <laughs> And so those have different rules. And of course, uh, our studio here is quite s- small with the people who are actually present with us today. Yeah, sure. So we're, we are following the rules. We have been sanitizing, right? That's right. And so uh, how have you guys been doing outside of, the, uh, of, of coming here to talk about uh, stuff on our podcast? Yeah. I've, I've just been home. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's pretty manageable from home, work from home. Uh, yeah. Everything else is, is pretty... It's pretty. It's been cold lately. Yeah. It has been very cold. The last couple of nights. I mean, they. I remember hearing in the news. I was. We're entering a polar vortex or something like that. Basically, just cold wind from the north coming down. Uh, but it has been really cold. Yeah. And we have chickens and dogs and stuff. We have outside dogs. Like our dogs stay outside most of the time. Uh, we bring them in at night mm-hmm. um, into the sunroom where it's not heated, but it's out of the elements. But like the last night, <laughs> last couple of nights, we just kind of okay. If it gets below a certain temperature, we take them in and put them inside. But then. In, the, in their kennels, in their cage, uh, their little crates. But uh, it smells like wet dog sometimes. Like in the morning, when I come downstairs, I go, oh, there's a wet dog smell. And then uh, they go right outside again. <laughs> but it's cool. it sounds like the kids after they take off all their snow stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's the same thing. Wait a second. It's smelling. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, on the COVID-19 front, like some, some days the numbers have come down and then it shoots up a little bit. But the number of deaths seem to be a little high. And of course, there's been uh, really bad outbreaks uh, in uh, long-term care. I know there's one in Sudbury. A number of deaths have happened there at the the, at a long-term care center. And uh, so, yeah, every day it's kind of changing. Hey, this uh, what's going on? And that's and that's what and then the hospitals are filling up. And so, because when the hospitals fill up, it's a lot harder for them, the medical professionals, to like they have to start making choices now. Do I take this person who's not breathing with COVID, or do I take this car crash victim? How do I like? And how do you determine which one goes on life support and which one doesn't? Yeah. Uh, and and sometimes age, like which one is going to make the better recovery, is a factor. I mean, I would hate to be in their position. I really would. It is. Uh, yeah, and kudos to the the nurses, the doctors, the staff. Oh, of the hospital. Yeah. Like I've been at the hospital a number uh, a number of times to anoint people. People uh, who have been at the end of their lives, so they let me in and yeah. with the proper protocols, and I'm covered and all these hazmat suit things. type thing. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> basically, and uh, they're just working so diligently, oh. and so you know, well, and, it, and and they're trying their best to keep everyone safe. So I have a lot of respect for them. And you think, gotta think too. If someone calls in sick. When someone calls in sick for for me, like if I call in sick, I cancel a class. I just don't teach it, you know. Um, but when someone calls in sick at the hospital for a nurse or whatever else the case may be, and if they're sick with let's say corona or they're not sure if it's corona or not, mm-hmm. that's a four or five or six days off that they have to take yeah. to get the testing back and make sure it's not chronic, it's just a results, cold or whatever. And, yeah. then, and then they come, so that means that they, like those five or six days of shifts have to be filled with the people that are healthy. So they're like, uh, my wife works as a nurse now and she, and they're like the amount of call-ins that she's getting just from one person being sick. Well, now they got to fill five shifts, yeah. but they're already stretched to the max. And so that's just a, like, they're running on skeleton crews sometimes. It's just crazy. I have a lot of respect for them. Yeah, for sure. And uh, we, we continue to pray for them too, yeah, to, yeah. <laughs> to be protected and all those different things. So th- that obviously has been uh, on our minds a lot, COVID-19. People are stuck at home. People are afraid of the virus. There's this variant now that say it's more... It's more uh, Came out of the European, potent, UK, European. and South Africa variant yeah. and all these different things. So um, obviously on the mind of, of people is when can we return to normal, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, I think with the release of the vaccine, uh, people have this hope that we're going to return to normal soon, later this year, whatever normal looks like after this is, yeah. after this is done. Um, and as a side note, you know, I, I just saw one of you, you know, Josh likes memes a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and I saw this nice meme uh, that said something like, uh, think, about, uh, think about the things we're missing right now. We're not missing our material goods. 
No. We're missing our family, our friends. That's right. People who are the close important to us. stuff, <laughs> and that should set us in the right uh, direction. Frame of mind oh, that's smart. When yeah. we go back to to a normal, right? Yeah. So the the vaccine has been released, and I don't know if it's a mix of people being stuck at home, reading a whole bunch of different theories, or or, or different news articles, or di from different places, but lots of people are mixed on the vaccine. And I, I know um, the government likes to put out this um, sort of rosy picture that everyone's excited to receive the vaccine, uh, but that's just not the case. Some people say they're not going to take it for maybe the, some people say, I, I, I don't take the flu. Sh like for example, for me, I've never had the flu shot. Yeah. I never had the flu. Uh, so people say, I don't take the flu shot. Yeah. I won't get the vaccine for COVID-19. Some people are saying uh, that they will take the vaccine. Then there's some people who are saying that there's, there's some moral issues around the vaccine. Mm -hmm. There's some conspiracy sort of theories around the vaccine and it, that it's been developed too fast, that there's not science behind it. So we're going to answer the question today or try to, um, if Catholics are morally, um, if it's acceptable yeah. for Catholics to take the vaccine, because I know that there's been sort of that question and uh, it comes from, uh, I don't know if you want to explain where, why, why is that even a question? Can Catholics take <laughs> the COVID-19 vaccine. The biggest, I think the biggest reason is, so I get to, I'm going to, I'm sure I'm going to talk a lot about this one only because it's a lot of science. And uh, that's never my, happens. Never, I never, never talk, never a, talk lot a lot. Of, I know I'm always yeah. quiet over yeah, on this side. Exactly. Uh, but, uh, but this one's a lot of science. So this is up my wheelhouse. For those people who don't know, um, one of my degrees, one of my backgrounds is in uh, sciences. And so I can teach high school, grade 12, uh, physics, chemistry, and biology. And this kind of falls right into that wheelhouse. Um, You're getting so excited. I do get I so excited when we're talking about this. <laughs> Um, okay, so the big thing right now is is that there's a link between um, science and vaccines and abortion. And there is a link there, and we'll get into that a little bit later on, I think. But it, it's, it's important to understand that the link there is far removed, or our link from between the two is we're far removed from the evil or the sin of the abortion itself, if that makes sense. Mm. So... Um, First of all, do you want to, want to get just into the science of it? Sure. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about real quick um, how our body reacts. So I'll talk about just basically the immune system and our immune system, how it works. Something foreign gets into our system, whether it be a, a virus or a, a, um, a bacteria. Our body automatically, um, we have these things called hyper T, uh, sorry, helper T cells. Helper T cells are like our little spots. They, they watch out and they go, hey, whoa, hey, you don't belong here. And what they do is automatically call the bouncers, and those are called killer T cells. And so the helpers, T, so the helper T cells, see them, say, "Oh, hey, okay, you're foreign, <laughs> you're, 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 you don't belong inside this body." And then they call the the killer T cells. The killer T cells come and basically tear the cell apart, uh, try to beat the cell, mm -hmm. and the immune system's kicked in, and the alerts drawn, and everything else, and and try to attack this foreign matter. So the way it happens with vaccines, um, the way that um, uh, a virus happens is a virus attaches, whereas in a bacterial infection comes in and it's a bacteria itself is the cell that reproduces itself. And so it's a foreign cell that reproduces itself on itself because it has a lot of food, a lot of your proteins and stuff in your blood. It's feeding off that. It grows, it grows, it grows. A virus basically attaches itself. It's a foreign, like a little spaceship that attaches itself to one of your cells, spits out a bunch of DNA stuff and basically overtakes or hijacks your cell right. to create more virus. And then that cell gets, it, it, it gets kind of torn apart. And then uh, we have a whole bunch of little these virus ships, if you will, that go off and attack more new cells, more cells. And then eventually our body springs into action. The difference becomes whether our immune system can create enough cells to fight it, enough, enough immunization to kill it and whatever, before it can spread to a point of causing major on problems. its own is on what its you're own saying. yes that's right and that's the point of a vaccine is to help boost that process so in right? that whole process yeah what happens is in that whole process our cells have what's called memory b cells okay <laughs> a lot of cells but basically what you want to know is that our cells have memory so when it sees something let's go with rubella when it sees rubella it goes oh if i've attacked rubella before i know its weak spots i know how to defeat it and so it remembers how to do that and it basically goes okay this is rubella we got this and it goes and it takes care of it right away before it can reproduce or before it can get too serious right how a vaccine works 
in the olden days, okay, and I'm going to talk about this because there's a new technology that's out there. In the olden days, how a vaccine used to work was they would take a whole bunch of, uh, let's say, rubella. They would take a whole bunch of this virus, rubella. Um, they would produce a whole bunch of it, and they would kill the DNA inside the little virus shells. And they would just inject you with empty or dead virus cells. So what happens is your body goes, your helper T goes, hey, you're foreign here. No response from the uh, rubella. But it says, okay, wait, 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 there's alarm. And so it raises the immune system. Uh, the killer T comes in, and they try to defeat it. And once they can defeat the virus shell, they can defeat the virus. And so what happens is with rubella, we get injected with a vaccine. We get injected with rubella, nothing alive, all dead, but it's just the shell itself. And so our body recognizes that outside of, the, okay, that's how it works, and jumps in and kills it. So that when you're in face with live rubella, it goes, hey, we've dealt with you before, knows how to kill it before it actually gets into your system. And that's how, that's how a vaccine works. Right. So the memory and every, all that stuff. The reason this comes into effect, there's a couple different things. Um, the way that we used to create viruses was we have to create a whole bunch of that virus and, so, and then kill off the DNA. But we have to create a whole bunch of the virus so we have the shell of the virus. And so what we used to do back in the early... With vaccines. With vaccines. We're creating vaccines. Sorry, yes. yes. To create the vaccine. Yes. Sorry. So we have to create a whole bunch of the virus so we can kill it off so that we have just the shell for the vaccine. In order to do that, we used to, not all the time, but we didn't know enough of science at that time, we used um, fetuses or abortion. And so we would use aborted fetuses because the cells were at, at a stage where they just replicated and kept replicating until certain proteins told it to turn off. At that time, if we could get it before that, you could inject it and the virus could grow inside these cells so that you can create a whole bunch of this vaccine and then kill off the DNA and inject it in somebody. And so they were using aborted fetuses for that at one time. Nowadays, that's not necessarily the case. Um, and even that, we can talk about the morality. We'll get into the morality of that part yeah. now. Um, what happens now, so that people know, Pfizer and Moderna, the two vaccines that are in Canada, and those are the ones that are allowed. Now, I won't get into all the other fun scientific stuff, but go look it up. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, but how, uh, how this works, it's a different type of vaccine. So instead of injecting you with um, the coronavirus shell, we don't do that. Coronavirus looks very specific. It basically looks like a sphere mm -hmm. with a bunch of golf tees in it. Yeah, it's like spiky. Yeah, yeah. a little spiky. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And so it looks very specific. And so um, what the coronavirus vaccines do, it's, called, it's using this new thing called mRNA. Right. Messenger RNA. That's basically, messenger RNA is the stuff that um, comes, our, our DNA basically tells it, it uses the messenger RNA to say, go create these proteins. What the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccines do is basically create a bunch of these mRNA cells, so not the vaccine at all, um, create a bunch of these cells, and it, what they do is they, they cover it in oil, that's why it's got to be at such a high temperature, because otherwise the oil breaks down, and they inject that into your system. A bunch of these little mRNA. If it was, wasn't covered in oil, wasn't everything, it would inject it into your system and your body would just eat it like that, no problem. But they inject it into your system, with covered in this little oil, and it in fact, acts as a virus. So it's using the virus's technology against itself. So what it does is it comes into your system and flows mm -hmm. down and finds a healthy cell. It attaches to the cell, it inserts this uh, mRNA, messenger RNA, and tells the cell to start producing these proteins. These pro proteins cause the cell to start creating these little golf tees. So what happens is your cell then looks like a, it's not the coronavirus, but it starts to look like the coronavirus to the point where your body, the little helper T cells see it, and they're like, hey, you're foreign. This is not cool. Sends, raises the awareness, raises the immune system, and sends the killer T bodies after it, killer T cells after it, and it attacks. Now, this is already a cell inside your body that's been mutated that's not working properly. The only thing that's meant to change is this extra protein, so it's not going to be... You know, so it's just changing that extra protein. And so changing that extra protein makes it look weird, but it's already not functioning. So it's easy to kill. But they figure out kind of how to kill it, and they recognize it. So as soon as they see it again, they don't have to spend time analyzing it. They just automatically raise the awareness system, the immune system, sorry, and, and they start producing antibodies so they can kill it fast. 
And our bodies are able to kill it. It's just how fast they're able to kill it before the virus takes over your system or whether you can kill it before it actually even reproduces. So that's the idea behind this vaccine is it's both of them inject us, they inject our cells, and then our body recognizes these little proteins and kill it. The reason we need to get it done twice is that sometimes the first one doesn't, like sometimes it's not enough. Sometimes it's just like a little bit connects to the, so uh, connects to your cells. And so you don't have enough of, uh, it doesn't have a chance maybe, maybe you have a really good immune system. It doesn't have a chance to actually not reproduce, but to create these proteins. Does that make sense? To make it look like the coronavirus. So you have to get it done twice. You have to get it done once. And then about a month later, depending 21 days for Pfizer, 28 days for Moderna, and then you get injected again. And the reason for that is because the body's still kind of fresh. And as soon as they see it, they're like, oh, hey, we just saw this last week. Hey, guys, they're coming back. You know what I mean? And then, they, and then they, but then it, it, it's in the system. The problem that we have is that these vaccines, specifically with Pfizer and Moderna, they're only, they're still new. They're still new. There's, we don't know the long-term effects on it. Changing around DNA inside your system, a little bit weird. Um, it's proven to be safe. It has been proven to be safe and yeah. not, not rushed through because they wanted to be the first ones. It's actually been proven. A lot of vaccines that were actually turned down because they weren't safe. But the science behind this one supports it. But basically, what's going to happen with this cell, your body's just going to eat it. And if it doesn't do what it's supposed to do, your body's just going to eat it. Like, there's nothing that's going to go on past that point. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and this past week, uh, Dr. Teresa Tan, yeah. who is the chief medical uh, doctor, yeah, I guess, yeah, yeah. For, Canada, for Canada, right? She met with about 1,300 religious leaders across Canada yeah. uh, to talk with them. I was part of the – it was on Zoom. Yeah. And so I was part of that uh, call. And uh, she talked about, too, that with, the, with how many vaccines they've already distributed, yeah. that there's low – because people are afraid of side effects and people are afraid yeah, of change. Yeah. Like the science does prove that there shouldn't be really any, even the allergic reactions and those things that you're talking about, um, the things that hasn't been tested on right now, 16 and up. And so Pfizer is 16 and up, Moderna is 18 and up, and, but Moderna's actually started testing on 12 to 17 now. The reason why this is, why this is so concerned, not concerning, why, why there's um, concern around it yeah. is because after 16, our bodies start to become like for males, they stop growing at the age of 25, women around 16, 17 starting testing after 16 years old, our bodies are already kind of at the point of growing, done growing and done um, testing younger than that. We don't know the effects. Could it warp someone's growth pattern? Because we are going in and changing a DNA. So if it changes the wrong one, it starts to replicate maybe because it has other proteins in the system or blood. That's why there um, hasn't been a lot of testing based on or why it hasn't been tested on pregnant or uh, lactate uh, women that are breastfeeding and stuff. So... Um, because we don't know and we don't want to. Now, all the animal studies that we've done have shown that there's nothing, no effects on mice or whatever the case may be. So there's not a lot to worry about, but we just kind of want to get everything under, under wraps before we get to there. When, and you see, like, especially if you're kind of on social media or just kind of following the news on it, that like, there's a range of concern about this kind of being rolled out, rolled out now. Yes. Um, and as, as you said, people, people have a lot more time on their hands, so they're, they're reading a lot more, which is, yeah. Yeah. Which is good. But... Um, uh, the the range of areas that you know are are cause for concern. So some people are concerned about the scientific. The like is yes. is this going to affect you know is this going to reprogram my biology? And like the yeah. answer is, is safely no. But people are concerned about okay, what's the process? How is this derived? Is it you know is is am I ethically compromised by getting this vaccine? You have other people who are um, yeah just saying is is it probably better for me to get get the virus itself so I can f fight it better. Like, yeah. Um, yeah. You, you have kind of a range of concern and people responding in different ways. So some people are, um, you know, it's, it's just a regular kind of discernment process. You're like, am, am I doing the right thing by getting a vaccine? Am I, should I avoid it if I'm a healthy person and can fight it anyway? Mm -hmm. um, and then on the other hand, you, you have people who are, who are afraid. Uh, afraid yeah. of the virus, afraid, uh, and that's largely exas exacerbated by the fact that you know, this is an unprecedented um, yeah. situation in my lifetime and in a lot of people's lifetime. Mm -hmm. That is like there, there's there's a compounding of of some of these anxieties that that yeah. people people are legitimately concerned and some people are afraid. Yeah. Um, and it's it's important to kind of sift out those motivations and kind of sift out the details so that you know we can have have a meaningful discussion about whether or not this is acceptable, whether or not this is appropriate, and whether or not you know, we should. Yeah, and, and let's move to that, like yeah. the moral aspect of it, right? Because you, you did mention that uh, there was testing on, on uh, aborted babies and, and all these different things. And so that's where the question of morality came in. Uh, would a Catholic be complicit 
in that sort of act, right? Because they were using yeah. these aborted babies for testing. But even the Vatican has it's released a statement man. saying that it is morally acceptable. Why? Why would they say it's morally? Yeah. Sorry, you know, and, and, and I think I think that's that's uh, part of what I was trying to get at. It's like, uh, w when you hear, it's like, yeah. they used aborted fetuses to <laughs> establish these cell lines. And like, that that should be a red flag to all Catholics. Like, that yeah. should uh, that uh, should put up a kind of a, like, no, this is hard stop. This yeah. is, we're, we're not, we're not, you know, collaborating with this evil. We're not, we're not participating in this. Um, I think what you were mentioning, and, and you yeah. can correct me if I'm wrong, that it's the cell lines That's right. that were used in the development were derived in kind of... Uh, a long-term derivative way from this, which Sorry. we should we shouldn't ignore. We shouldn't we shouldn't try and just kind of sweep that under the right. under the carpet. Yeah. But we should acknowledge maybe the distinction between these weren't tested on uh, uh, fetuses that were the, the direct result of an abortion. Sorry. That the agency is degrees removed. That the cell lines that are are being used mm -hmm. were der uh, like were derived from these kind of a long time ago. Again, not not to be dismissive of. Of it, but also to to introduce that clarity or introduce that kind of specificity, because it, I think it does matter and it does kind of it, uh, it really influence it the the what, what the Vatican is saying. It's not right. saying that it's it's okay <clears throat> if there's no alternative available. It's saying that these it, these cell lines specifically not yeah. aborted fetuses. And, and, that's, I, and I think that's the the clear distinction. So there are vaccines. So to make known, scientific studies are done on aborted fetuses. Uh, there are there are things going on, as I said before, in the early stages of development of a human. Um, these cells reproduce fast; um, they're duplicating, and so we and so scientific study has been done on aborted fetuses, specifically to make vaccines as well as to create them. And so, like some of the vaccines, and I, I keep using rubella. I don't know that's rubella that does it. I'll have to go back and do my research on it. But there are vaccines that were used and created. Basically, they they created these vaccines or the shell of these vaccines. Vaccines. Um, sorry, not vaccines, of the virus itself inside an aborted fetus. And they, cause it, they kept, and they kept feeding it through that, through that so that these cells would multiply. And, and that was wrong, right? And they were using the abortion directly in the testing and, and that kind of stuff. And that was on the early days aside. So it was just wrong and the church has clarified that and everything else. What we're using now is what you said, the cell lines. So what a cell line is, basically, if you wanted to, I could have a cell line of Matt. If, and we swab Matt's cheek and it takes a piece of Matt and then I have a bunch of his cells on a swab. So I put it in a special solution. I create a culture, uh, a, a cell culture. And basically all the DNA and the way that they function, it's all based on mat. Okay? <laughs> and I can grow this. And then I normally, if I'm doing scientific experiments, I would split it into three different categories. One, I'm going to keep some of mat to test later on, <laughs> of mat cells <laughs> to test later on. And then I'm going to have the one that I'm going to um, do experiments on. Uh, and oh, like I'm going to inject it with uh, the vaccine, let's say, and just see how this vaccine, I'm going to watch through a microscope how the vaccine works on these cells. And then I have another one of like basically the placebo. I'm going to inject it with something different and just see if it's the same thing or if like what I've done is different or, you know, so I'm going to have those two that I can study side by side. I'm going to have a, a little side one that I've created uh, of Matt. The next time, okay, I did a test. I didn't get the results I wanted, or I got the results I wanted. I want to replicate the test. I grab Matt again over here, my <laughs> Matt cells. I bring it over. But again, it's not Matt. It's, it's like a photocopy. So basically, if you take a textbook and you photocopy it, you have a page come out the other end. That, that textbook that I got the photocopy, I can put that on the shelf. I'm not, I'm not using that. That's not, that's not what I use. But I'm using this photocopy of the textbook. And I can make a bunch hmm. of cell du duplicates from that. And so once I make a whole bunch of cell duplicates, now I can do whatever I want to this piece of paper. I can crumple it up. I can throw it out. Why is that important or why do we do that? Because these cell lines that we've got created came from, unfortunately, abortion or um, 60, year, uh, 60 years ago, 1960s. There's two lines specifically that are used in the, in the um, science testing. Why do we use or why do big companies still use those lines? Why don't they just go swab somebody's cheek and do that? It's because there are 60 years of data and experimentation done on these specific types of cells and the DNA. So we know exactly how this DNA specifically, let's say mass DNA versus Father Danielli's DNA, mass DNA is going to react this way to this sodium chloride, whatever, formula. Whereas if I introduce it to Father Daniele's, it might react different. Maybe you have an allergy or maybe you have something different going on. So I know how mat cells are going to react because I've done 60 years of data and testing and everything else on it. Again, it's not on the fetus. There isn't, uh, unfortunately, yeah. it's, it's just a cell line. It's a photocopy. And, 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 it's, it's, and that's what they're used now. So 
Pfizer and Moderna, there are, there are vaccines out there that used aborted fetuses to create this, and that's wrong. We're not going there. But on cell lines, these are photocopies of photocopies of photocopies of photocopies from the 1960s, uh, and, and, and it was an abortion that started it. But we're 60 years past that, and we're still testing on the same cell, cell, line. cell, cell line. It's not the same cells, it's not the, <clears throat> any, yeah. you know, but it is the same DNA that was attached to those. And, and the two vaccines, yeah, it does. And the two vaccines that you're talking about, like from Moderna and Pfizer, they were tested on that, right. on those cell lines, but not on aborted fetuses, right. right? So they were tested. So they didn't use aborted fetuses. What they did is they took a bunch of human cells, and they said, okay, we know exactly how this is yeah. supposed to react. Let's pump our new vaccine in. Hey, it does. We have 60 years of data. This is what the computer says it's going to do. This is what our theoretical says what we're going to do. Let's actually do it now. So we pump it into this data, and we can actually say, hey, it works. It does what we say it's supposed to do. This is exciting. We've got a vaccine. Now we can use it. Okay. So, and, and the Catholic bishops, bishops of Alberta, Northwest Territories, they released a statement saying that, that because it was the cell line, that the, it was morally acceptable for, for uh, yeah. Catholics to receive this vaccine and cleared up that problem. I have a a few quick uh, questions for you guys. Try and answer them uh, as, as quick as possible. Sorry, yeah. We're running out of time. But the, I'm just going to raise some things that people are saying about the vaccine. Yeah. And you guys tell me in 20 seconds or 30 yeah. seconds what you think. Okay? So, number one, uh, some people have said that it's not actually a vaccine. That it's another um, type of... It's a vaccine. Now, I want to make sure you're getting injected with mRNA. As I said before, it turns your cells... But your, your cells don't reproduce this mRNA then and spread it to your body. That's not what happens. It gets, it's produced, and it just kills a cell, basically, one cell. And so you get a, a specific shot of that. That's why you have to get two so that you have enough of this. It doesn't reproduce. So okay. it's not an old-style vaccine. It is a new style vaccine. Using new technologies, which new, you have, exactly. which you have new, said. New technology. So it is. Okay. Uh, some people are saying that this came out way too fast that uh, this vaccine was created way too fast. Uh, vaccines usually take much longer uh, to, to come into play. Yeah, well, I, yes and no. So um, it came into existence probably quicker than a lot of other ones did, but the, the COVID situation um, uh, expanded more rapidly than the normal viruses tend to. Um, also, I, uh, for which, which is the one that gives you the POC, which the, the old vaccine? Is oh, gives you the little thing. Yeah, yeah. No, I can't polio? remember. Is it really the pop? German music? No, that no, that that uh, the vaccine that um, I, I I normally bow out of these conversations because <laughs> my, my my wife is like she uh, the medical she, professional. Yeah, yeah, and she just like explains all these things. I'm like, how do you know all that stuff? Um, but she uh, so when they were developing that something, they had to. It was actually they put blood. Um, oh, from yeah, yeah, people who had recovered from the virus. That is like. We're just going to try this out because this is expanding so rapidly that we mm -hmm. so um, kind of by comparison Here that are the antibodies yeah. yeah like you know historically plagues and kind of major viruses major outbreaks that like they needed to respond quickly they didn't always have you know the the Technology. all 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 of the full range of data that they would otherwise have but I think it is kind of telling that the data that they do have is is supportive of the idea that. You know that that fewer people are going to be negatively impacted by this than maybe allowing the virus to continue on its its current path. And there and there were years and years of data on it, and, yeah. and I mean years years and years of study on specific vaccines and stuff because it took years and years and years to create. We have the technology now, we have the data, and then because the world started to shut down, so many people started to die and all that stuff. People, governments threw money at the situation, so all sure. of a sudden now, I mean, the, the world was at a standstill. Exactly, we couldn't do anything. Of course, all our focus was going to be on this vaccine. I know a couple of people that are researching cancer uh, vaccines and everything else they're all their research stopped yeah and they switched to, to COVID yeah and so like you got to think labs across the world yeah. everybody was doing that right like because cancer wasn't killing people as well I mean it does but you know I mean or like specific things weren't killing people as fast as this was killing so okay uh, so just to clarify um, I have two more things uh, and we're running out of time so uh, quick <laughs> but the, the the two popes, uh, Pope Francis and Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, both, got it. both received the vaccine uh, mm -hmm. a number of weeks ago, or last uh, two weeks ago, I think. And uh, so the official, if people are wondering, can, as a Catholic, can I take the vaccine, the Moderna, the Pfizer vaccine that's available in Canada? The, the answer is? Yes. I, I think yes. And I think it's important to cite 
uh, what the Vatican released on it to say yeah. that these are the conditions under which it is morally permissible because it is, um, it's it's nuanced and precise enough to say that it's like no, we are not participating in the this specific evil that um, we we still want to say is, is completely wrong. Right. That we're not the supporting abortion through is, doing yeah. this vaccine. We're okay. not supporting right because uh, that's the big thing. Yeah, and we're not trying to answer the question: sh uh, Should you take the vaccine? No. Right. But can you? Yes. yes. Like so people are free to make up their mind about yeah. them. Okay. But my last question yeah. for you, and as quick as you can, because this is a bit of a heavy yeah. one. I don't know why I pulled it out at this moment, <laughs> but I think it's a good question. Should Catholics take the vaccine because of our teaching on the common good? Yes, I and, and I I would say yes, um, just because um, that uh, with reference to the common good, that's that's the objective. That is, and, and we can talk about kind of philosophical agency and uh, moral implication and all of those things. But like even even analogously, and this is just off of, off the top of my head. But if, say um, say you uh, had you were part of a very wealthy family um, and you were asked to donate you know a lot of money um, so you know four generations ago your family actually owned you know a plantation and you know this this you, you had slave and like you your family generationally was part of a specific moral evil and you could say that you could you could attribute some of your current wealth to the fact that you know that they, they generations ago this this was a problem but if you have an opportunity to do good now with that wealth, and you're not doing anything that is, you know, morally compromising, you sh you should do that for the sake of the common good. That's my justification for my actions. Mm -hmm. Whether or not I would kind of extend that or impose that on anyone else. That's, Can I say the other yeah. the other part there on that is you have to look at the science behind it. Right now, as the science suggests. What it does in your system, this whole virus stuff, I'm not going to get into all the science behind it, but basically it stops symptoms in your system. It doesn't necessarily, we don't know the testing on asymptomatic patients, meaning people who have the virus but don't show any symptoms. Right. There's, there's no, we can't prove that yet because it's still too new. And so what it does is it stops the virus from hurting you. Hmm. It doesn't hurt, stop you from necessarily spreading the virus. And it doesn't stop you from necessary. So that's why if you get the virus, you still have to wear your mask. You still have to wash your hands. Sure. You still have to do everything that, that you would regularly do. But like it's like the flu shot. If you got the flu shot, you can still carry the flu. You can still pass the Potentially. Flu. Well, yeah. it depends on the thing. But yeah. So that's so what I would say that it, like if, if you are of that age um, in the 60 plus and you're worried about your health and stuff, go ahead. You're morally allowed to receive it. Um, it's safe. And go for like go for it. If you're under that age and you're a little bit concerning and everything else, you want to look at, you can still pass it just the same as everything else. Right. So whether you receive it or not, it's going to be up to you. I think morally you're allowed to. Um, the Pope has actually made some words talking about how you should receive it, mm. depending on how the virus mm. reacts and how, I mean, the vaccine works and stuff. Now, the vaccine doesn't quite work in the sense of like, okay, you're on it. Now you are immune. You don't, you can't catch it. Right. You can't, but you know what I mean? But it doesn't mean you can't pass it along. Pass it along. So, um, yeah. Okay, yeah, I think it's worth just just, just adding that the, the language uh, is is pretty specific about moral philosophy. That yeah. it's like it is morally permissible, but not morally obligatory. Exactly. That it's 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 acceptable to do so, but Catholics you are say. if if your own discernment reveals that you shouldn't or you're not comfortable, comfortable doing it, yeah, that is that is your call. Exactly. And that's a good place uh, yep. to stop because this is uh, one of those topics today that are really spicy right? yeah. <laughs> people are on all sides yeah. of it and people have their own thoughts and their own uh, um, you know they, they they're really passionate about this topic so but I think we addressed some of the things uh, like I said with this call with Ter Dr. Teresa Tan she asked sort of religious uh, leaders in in Canada to really look at the facts look at what we're talking about yeah. like you did today you talked yeah. a lot about the science behind it uh, to talk about this openly with people because People are just sitting behind a computer screen or their phone screen and sort of reading all these different things about it and coming up with their own uh, sort of theories, right? So I'm glad we had this discussion. I'm sure it's going to spark, spark yeah, I know. <laughs> some <laughs> feedback. I can't wait to see what people have their response uh, for Josh. Can I just say right off the top? There are no known technologies to track a human being that can fit through the head of a needle. I just wanted to hit that right out there so we can't inject, the government can't inject you with uh, GPS tracking services or anything yet. I'm a computer science professor. I know what I'm talking about in this. Uh, but um, all the other stuff, do your research, get comfortable with it. Be comfortable receiving the vaccine if that's what you want to do. Your church says you're allowed. 
It doesn't say you have to. It says you're allowed. That's right. So, yeah. And I, I just had a thought while you were talking that maybe when it's time to uh, receive the vaccines, yeah. we can watch Matt get the vaccine live on <laughs> this podcast. And that would be a great way to... So an, yeah. another episode, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Resident yeah. guinea pig. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you have comments, which I'm sure you do, or feedback, uh, if it sparks some questions in your mind uh, for anything we talked about today uh, regarding the vaccine uh, for COVID-19 or any other moral moral question that's surrounding the, our Catholic faith, send us an email at the Catholic Buzz Podcast at gmail.com. We're happy to hear from you, and we will answer your questions uh, on another episode of The Catholic Bus. So my name is Father Daniele, and for Josh Sullivan and Matt Van Milgen, we'll see you next time on The Catholic Bus.